Welcome to the Wheelbarrow Profits Podcast, where you get multifamily investing made real. Learn from top players in the real estate investment world as they share their secrets with you and discover proven strategies on apartment investing that actually work. To learn more about Wheelbarrow Profits, visit jakeandgino.com, your one-stop shop for everything multifamily. Now to your hosts, Jake and Gino. Hello, everybody. This is Jake Stenziano, host of the Wheelbarrow Profits podcast. Here with my co-host, the best-selling author of Wheelbarrow Profits, philanthropist, family man, business guru, real estate investor, known to many as Papa G Business, the man, Gino Barbaro. Gino, how's it going today? J-Love, the introductions are getting better and better. How you doing? Bringing the pain. So today's very special guest is Lou Cardillo. Lou is the broker and chairman of Keller Williams Realty Partners in Yorktown Heights, New York. Lou has sold over 700 homes in his career, and his team is number one in their market. The reason he is successful comes down to two things, systems and marketing. He treats his business like a business and educates uh, and dedicates himself to his team. Lou has a great business mind, and today we are looking to steal best practices from him on how he's grown his business. So without further ado, Lou, welcome to the show. Hey, great. Thanks for having me. I appreciate you guys taking the time. Oh, it's our pleasure. So Not let's blue. jump right in. Let's jump right in. Tell us about your real estate background. So I've been in the business for 20 years. Um, started the business from nothing. Um, not a fam- not a uh, child or a family member of a broker. Um, I was actually trying to find something to do when I got out of college because I actually thought I wanted to be a, a chef, get into like the restaurant business, and realized rather quickly that I um, didn't uh, like that lifestyle per se. So um, I opened up the Penny Saver one day. I saw an ad that said, you know, um, make your own hours, be your own boss, set your own income. And I kind of liked what it was saying to me. So I went to a seminar and it was about real estate. And I figured I could throw in a suit and a tie and get into real estate. And I did 20 years ago and I uh, never looked back. I loved it uh, from day one and uh, built a pretty good business since. But I've, I've learned, which I don't think a lot of brokers really do learn. They, they, don't, they don't treat it like a business. They keep it more like a career or a hobby. But um, once, what I really learned about seven years ago was uh, building a business, leveraging through people, and creating something bigger than myself, and becoming more of a uh, marketing expert than a real estate agent. And once I started developing that mindset, and like a huge paradigm shift happened, and that's when my business really started taking off. Lou, when did that, when did that occur in your career? How many, how many years were you into the business that that paradigm shift occurred? I got to say, you know, it started almost 10 years ago when I started thinking about it, but about seven years ago, I kind of really put it into play. So about 10 years ago, I bought my first uh, real estate franchise, which is Keller Williams, and they really got me to start thinking differently. I mean, before Keller Williams, I was thinking differently. I knew that there was, some, I could, there was better ways to do things, but through the Keller Williams systems and models, it actually kind of um, really all came to light. But um, I actually... I pretty much stopped selling real estate for a little while because I, I was opening my franchise and I pretty much just turned my business over to whoever was in my life at the time. And um, going to the, the Keller Williams system, I realized, you know what, I can actually own a franchise system and continue to list and sell real estate and build a business because if I could make it not about me and have other people do it for me, I couldn't run both businesses. So that's when about seven years ago, I actually um, kind of revived per se my, my sales team and uh, made it more of a, uh, a business around other people with my name, my brand, and um, they've helped me get to places I never thought possible. And you know what's cool about that story to me? Seven years ago is when the economy was crapping out, basically. Oh, yeah. yeah. And what you did was you didn't make your exterior an excuse. Whatever was happening That's- in the exterior, you did not make an excuse to say, oh, I'm not going to have real estate. I can't grow my business. You did the opposite. When everyone's contracting, you're growing, and you're just – kicking ass as I would say because that seven years ago we're in the same market me and you there was nothing going on here everyone was right. downsizing and you took the bull by the horns and you ran with it. I'm really I'm really impressed with that I, I didn't know it was that time period thanks you know? you know the thing I want to say about that is the re- one of the reasons why I did take a leap of faith back then was because all the brokers around me were contracting and a lot of the, the bigger names back then were getting out of the business or weren't growing or changing with the times mm-hmm. and I said even though the business is um, even though the, the brokers are contracting the market's changing I said, there's still real estate out there that needs to be sold. So if I can develop and build now where people are pulling money out of the market, put money into the market, into marketing, branding, and growing, you know, once the market rebounds and turns around, I'll be sitting on top. And that's kind of what happened, per se. That's awesome. Uh, Love that. I, I, 
you know, so so that's why um, you know we are where we are today. Lou, how many bro, how many agents did you start out with, and how many do you have today currently? Back in 2006, I started with four agents, um, and we've had up in excess of almost 200 agents at one point. But you know, every now and then we clean people out and and um, send them you know to other businesses, I guess, or to the world. But right now, we currently have 128 agents, um, and our goal for 2016, uh, by the end of 2016, is to be back up to 200 agents. But you know, it, it all sounds good. People say, "Oh, I got 200 agents on my roster." We want to make sure we want to have productive agents because un- unless they're closing real estate, we don't really want them with the company. So we want to have really 200 agents actually producing income for themselves, their families, and for us. That's awesome. That's a, that's a huge growth. What what changes have you seen in your field in these last 10 years? That you started out back in 06, 07 till now? Um, I, I gotta say, one of the biggest things is the internet. I mean, um, just how the internet is, is making the business much easier for us in a way of terms of leverage. I'm not saying the, the world is easier, but you can leverage so much through other people, through internet sources, through the web, through virtual assistants who don't even live in this country, through, um, through market people who do my market. So, my team right now, I have people who are doing marketing for me that are overseas. I have people who do marketing for me in Austin, Texas. I have, most of my team is outsourced. The people that are in-house is my, my one full-time admin and um, the people that actually list and sell real estate for me. But everything else is pretty much outsourced. So I realized um, when, the world, when the world was going more internet-based and people could, like we're doing a Skype call right now. Like, you, you know, I don't know, if you, could you do this 10 years ago? I'm not sure. You know, or was it the way it is today? I couldn't so, do it two months ago. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so we do a lot of Google Hangouts. We do a lot of Skype calls with our team and stuff. But uh, that changed a lot. Uh, print, print media, you know, changed to um, digital media a lot. And, uh, and in my market, most of the brokers have not changed at the time. So that's what makes me more successful in my market because some of the brokers and agents still don't get it. But um, we leverage money and resources through the Internet and um, – we do see that we can actually track the return on our investments easier by seeing where people are going, how they're clicking, how they're looking, what are they searching for, what price range are they searching in. So all the anal- analytical data that we're bringing back from everything we're investing creates a very clean snapshot for us on what's going on in the market, in our micro market here, which is you know northern Westchester and Putnam County. Uh, and my main market is actually um, uh, May Impact New York. So you, you brought up a, a great point about virtual assistants. H- how do you look for virtual assistants? Why don't you tell our audience how they can go about and find the virtual assistants? So um, I've used a few different companies over the years. Um, I don't, I've used them um, from, a, from a website called Fiverr.com, F-I-V-E-R-R.com, where basically the name speaks for itself. You can pay five bucks to do um, one-off projects with people. Um, if you like what they're doing on one-off, you can actually hire them for more of a full-time um, I found, though, through the quality of what I was getting, I was doing a lot of the um, – a lot of stuff I was getting was not quality work, so I kind of don't use them unless it's something that I don't really need to be high quality. Um, but um, one company I use right now, uh, they just changed their name. It used to be, um, they, it's called Upwork, upwork.com, yep. which is mostly for real estate agents, I, I believe. Um, but they are a virtual assistant company that provides us um, services from – checklists to um, calling, you know, they call into our neighborhoods. Of, uh, oh, that's one thing I leverage too a lot now. I used to do a lot of cold calling myself, um, but I actually leverage that through what we call an ISA, an inside sales agent, um, and they're actually making a lot of calls to our neighborhoods, so I've actually leveraged out that piece of my business, and they work the leads until they um, become something that's fruitful that we want to work with, and then we go out and do the presentation, and we take over from there. Um, but I started that with Upwork.com. That's awesome. Um, Cool. Yeah. So, uh, oh, and one other thing is, most agents um, do try to do everything themselves. They work with buyers themselves. They work with sellers themselves. They try to do all the admin work themselves. You know, there's only so much you can do. And I know that what I'm really good at is no negotiating, marketing, and and overseeing and running a business. And if I just stick to those three things and delegate everything else out, um, yes, it costs money. I mean, I'm not saying it doesn't, but um, you have to make an investment to grow. And um, you know, I, I really honestly touch my real estate sales business right now less than 20 hours a week. Um, and I make more money now than I did, you know, 10 years ago doing 80 hours a week. We that actually we actually call that the I'm a mentality. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do everything yeah. myself. You know, that, that, yeah, that's how we started out. 
But you got hey, to scale. I, honestly, when I when I first did it, I was scared as, as hell. Yep. I said nobody could do this the same way I could. No one could do the same way I could. But I I, I realized because I, I was being coach at the time. I said, listen, you got to let people uh, leverage. Um, you got to leverage what you don't like doing through other people, and you got to let them fail. And then you got to be able to put systems and checklists in place to make it to make them hold to the way that you would do it, to hold to your standards. So every time I saw something that I didn't like. I would just say, okay, great. Let me just put a checklist or a system behind that. This is how I want it done. And as soon as they start following suit, they're, they're working as they're an extension of me. And um, it just leverages, leverages the crap out of me. And it's just they're all doing it for me. Well, what's great about that is you're also empowering your employee. When, you, when you're giving your employee the checklist and the system that they can follow, I mean, the, the, the thing is you have to make the system easy enough for any employee to follow. And once that system is easy followable, as I would say, um, you empower that employee. The employee feels more responsible. He takes on more, and you have confidence in him. You can get more done, and he can get more done. It's it's like a win win situation. I always keep talking to Jake about it. that. Win win is awesome. Right, absolutely, one hundred and ten percent. So we're talking about the internet right now. What social media are you currently using right now? Like Facebook, uh, LinkedIn. Uh, or- yeah, I mean, we use um, pretty much six sources. Um, the two ones that are actually working for us is Facebook and Twitter. But we use um, LinkedIn. We use LinkedIn, Pinterest, Google Plus, Facebook, Twitter, uh, and there's one more we use. Instagram. Instagram. What is it? You guys use an Instagram? Oh, Instagram. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> That's the other one. So those are the six that we use. Um, I honestly don't know much about social media, and I just leverage that out, and it gets done for me. It's working for us. How it's working, I really can't explain or know. Uh, or tell you, but um, you know, I actually didn't jump onto the social media bandwagon until about two years ago because I didn't really get it, and that's the one thing that held me back. I said, well, until I understand what's going on, I really don't want to jump into it. But um, then I realized, you know, what do I have to know? Just let people do it for me and uh, leverage through that, through them, and then they'll bring me leads back. So um, I still don't. I mean, I, I, I use social media. Don't get me wrong, and I and I understand it, but not to the highest level possible. Like I still don't really understand how Twitter works, but. It's working for us. I'm with you. I'm with you. I feel your pain. <laughs> <laughs> but people think I do. They're yep. like, oh, wow, that's a great post you put out there on Twitter. And that thing you said, I'm like, oh, okay, sure, yeah, it was awesome. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the one thing about uh, social media, though, if you have the, v- the you know, virtual assistant team going, what me and Jake have found is that you have to constantly keep pounding the pavement, keep sending out you know, quality posts. So you exactly. have somebody doing that for you. Me and Jake are, are on the learning curve. We've been doing that for the last few months and struggling with it. But you have to be out there all the time with social media every day, you know, peppering people, but with quality stuff, not with crap. You have to put quality no, stuff on. Stuff that they're gonna find anywhere else. So what, the one thing yeah. I do with the social media is that before they put posts out there, we put together a timeline, a plan for posts that we're going to do, you know, holidays and stuff like that always happen. But, it, you know, I get to see what they're going to post. And then I actually get input, and I and I, I type stuff up, and I find things, and like yesterday we did a post on uh, rates went up. You know, we did something on, on uh, interest rates going up for the first time in almost ten years. You know, but you know I do approve ninety percent of what goes out there, um, so it does sound like me. You know, so it's not like someone just totally like doesn't sound like the way that I would talk and stuff like that. So that piece I do, but what they do with the content, you know, I don't know, it just gets out there. So let me ask you another question real quick. What, what is your best real estate investing tip or advice for the listeners right now? Um, I, you know, <laughs> I guess one of the biggest things is that you know, OPM, other people's money. Everything I've kind of done up to this point, I've tried to get investors and partners and things that I've done. Um, one, to help them uh, gain more wealth you know, with me, obviously. But I always, I've always learned that I don't, I don't know it all and everyone kind of knows more than me. It's kind of the attitude I have. So no matter what it is I do, I always want to try to get somebody who um, can help me grow. So um, investing-wise, I just, I, just, I just think it makes sense to try to uh, get other people involved in everything that you do. Don't try to do everything yourself. Well, I think that's a great point because when you, when you do invest, maybe you have partners, but maybe you're you know, also partnering with a bank. When mm-hmm. you invest with that bank, that bank – is going to you're going to your tenants if you say you're doing multifamily the tenants are going to be paying that note off every month right absolutely so you yeah. you are leveraging the bank's money there you're leveraging the tenants money to pay that off and you are the beneficiary so i think that's a great point and one thing that i do also and the reason why i was saying it that way like right now we're building um, some houses and i have partners on that could i build a house myself yes could i do everything myself but i bring partners and not just for the capital so the other thing i bring them in for is 
to leverage through them to run and manage the projects. So on multifamilies that we have, someone else handles the day-to-day, -day, you know, calls from the landlord, I mean from the tenants. Um, the house that we're building, I, I have my other, my partner's thing is he put up the money, but also since I brought the deal to the table, I put up money, but also now he's also the one who's running the job. So I don't ever want to be in a position where that one project or one property is going to take over my life. So I, when I bring people in, it's one for capital, but also the leverage through them to make sure that they're the ones who are going to manage and oversee that project for all the phone calls and everything like that. Time leverage. I got it. Time leverage. 110%. Yeah. I've also said about partners, me and Jake, the reason why we work great is, uh, you know, you have a partner, you're held accountable. So uh, when I'm having a rough day, I'll jump on the call with Jake. Hey, you know, I'm having a tough time. He holds me accountable. So, you know, the business is going. We have to, you know, put it in. And when he's having a tough time, he'll give me a call. Um, you have different skill sets. Me and Jake have sort of similar but different skill sets. So you can bring that to the table as a partner. Um, and just, you know, the fact that you guys have different ideas and, you know, and you can bring them together and mesh them together as one partnership, I think is really positive to have partnerships. Absolutely, 100%. And then, and then those partnerships always lead to something else. So even if you think, oh, you know, I'm going to bring somebody on this one, I can do it myself, because there's a lot of things I can do myself. But the relationships and networking you make through some partnerships are just great. Because the one project that we're working on now, which we're showing a pretty good return on for um, some, that, some that we're building, the guy who was the private finance guy behind it wants us now to go out and find bigger projects. And he wants us to invest $5 million over the next 12 months into... Uh, different avenues. So with that being said, you know, would the opportunity have been there if I decided to be a hog and do everything myself? Uh, no, it probably wouldn't have been because I never met the guy. But, you know, it's just all that happens and, and everything happens for a reason. And, you know, the bigger your network, um, the bigger your world gets. That's, I'm glad you brought that point up because I want to talk about networking really quick because I think networking is so important in the real estate business. Do you have any tips on networking for, uh, for our listeners? Um, so I've the one of the things that I do very very well is I'm a very good modeler. I'm I don't think I'm a great um, like everything I've ever thought of. I always thought was like oh my great idea, but I've realized that there's nothing in real estate that I've ever thought of that no one else thought of before me. Mm -hmm. So everything I've thought of, I've just I've always through the, my Keller Williams network first of all, since we're the largest real estate company uh, actually in the world now. But um, I've always leveraged through my Keller Williams network of other brokers in other areas of the country. So networking on a local basis, I don't do a lot of it with, um, with local agents. Um, I do network with business owners and uh, people in my market area to get them to list and sell real estate with me. But on a bigger scale of growing and building my business, I've modeled everything from other successful realtors in other parts of the country. I've flown out to their offices, spent a day with them. I've done Skype calls with them. I've done you know, Google Hangouts. Uh, and we share information back and forth. So the free flow of information you know, if someone else has done it, I always feel that someone's lived before you and success leaves clues. So if they're doing it at a higher level, you can take all the mistakes out of it and, um, and um, tweak it for your market or what you're looking to do and, and run with it. So um, networking is, is huge. And within my network of Keller Williams, um, I always lean on the network of agents throughout the country to uh, help me grow my business. You said you didn't do that much local stuff. I mean, do you belong to like the Chamber of Commerce or anything no. locally where you can drum up business? Or I don't. Um, you know, I've never really. Okay, so if you look at my personality, um, there's a thing in my Keller Williams system called you know, you know, we do a personality assessment, and it's a DISC. Yes. So I'm like a DC personality, um, high driven, and C, which is kind of analytical. I can bring up what they call the I, the influential part when I need to, like on a presentation basis. But for the most part, I'm really not the one that's going to be out there and, and, and uh, the light of the show or like the, the one that's going to turn over the room when I walk in and, and shake hands and kiss babies kind of deal. Um, I do it to a certain amount, but no, I, I really honestly don't find that that's the most effective use of my time. People have told me I've done it. My coaches tell me I should do more of it, but I just don't like it. So I just send my team out to do it and they bring back business. That's great. That's awesome. <laughs> Let me, let me ask you a question. What, what is your best habit for success? What do you think is really you know, your pinnacle re reason uh, gives you success? Um, I, okay, so a few things. One, I have ADD. So I think that a lot of times I, <laughs> I do things like uh, most people would think everything all the way through, which my analytical side tries to do that a lot. But sometimes I'm just like ready, fire, aim, just see what happens kind of deal. And sometimes I'm successful and sometimes I lose and sometimes, uh, you know, um, if I lose money, that's my learning lesson. But the best money I ever spent was on, on things that I failed at. 
So I love failing. Like I, I love failing because it makes me grow, makes me learn, learn on a daily basis. Secondly, I get very early in the morning. I'm up before 5 a.m. Um, just because that's my time in the morning to, to go over my business for the day, to kind of see, um, to set up projects for the day. But um, getting up early um, really helps. Working out helps because um, it keeps your mind, you know, keeps your mind straight. It gets your endorphins released. Um, also, what makes me successful, I think, is that I have a high level of uh, tolerance. Um, how do I want to say it? Like, um, I can do a lot of things at one time, and I, and I really am not satisfied unless I have a lot of plates spinning, which a lot of other people that look at me go, how the hell could you do all this? You know, but I need a lot going on. I need a lot of things going. I need a lot of, a lot of uh, people to um, talk to on a daily basis about businesses that we're running. And um, I, I persevere through things. Where other people I think will pull out, you know, I, I take risks and I move forward with stuff. Um, not always successful, to be honest, but um, I think where people get scared and run away, you know, I'm the guy that usually pushes through. That's funny. I think uh, you just, I think you just uh, described Jake to a T. You guys related or something? <laughs> <laughs> oh. No, listen, you got to be growing. You got to be doing a lot or, uh, you know, you get bored and, and unsatisfied. You know, the minute you yeah. accomplish a goal, that's, that's when the letdown kicks in and you, you got to throw some more stuff in the hopper and then keep, keep going with it. Uh, I get bored oh. if I don't. People look at me all the time and they go, wow, Lou, you're so successful. You're 38 years old. Look at what you built. And I'm like, yeah, that's cool. I just built a really big house too. And people are like, wow, look what you achieved. Like I don't, I don't ever feel it that way. Like I, don't always, like I never stop and look and go, wow, look at where I've gotten. Like I'm always just pushing forward. And it's not for me and it's not about the money. It's really about the lifestyle provides for me and my children because it really – oh, and that's another thing that makes me successful, honestly, is that when I got into the business at 18 years old, um, I – um, my wife now, um, she was my girlfriend back then, but um, we had a ready-made child before, uh, before we got married. So that was like the first big push was like, oh my God, you know, now I have a family I got to provide for. And now as we grow and I have two other children, so I have three all together, everything's for them. And everything I do, I just think about providing for them, providing for their schools, for their future, and then um, also my retirement as well. But I don't really live in, I try not to live in the now. I want to give them a great life, but um, I'm just always looking at tomorrow and the future and what's that going to look like and you know what I've heard some people you know they try, try to think that the perfect life and um, things happen through you of course or you know you could die so you got to stop and smell the roses so every now and then I you know sit back and enjoy my time but uh, for the most part I'm just always pushing for them. Lou it sounds like you're smelling all the roses man you're doing it come on now. <laughs> yeah but it's <laughs> <laughs> um, two other things I do that's successful is um I set plans for the year. Um, I set my goals for the year. Um, and then also on a weekly basis, I look at my goals, where I am and where I have to go. And I keep focused on them as well. So that really helps, you know, realign myself on a, on a weekly basis in case I'm off track. Jake, I'm telling you, he must be your cousin or something. <laughs> Brother from another mother. Here we go. <laughs> I'm telling you, Jake, Jake's got this coaching sheet that he, he works out every, every uh, Sunday night. He plans his week out. And that's really important because you've got to write it down. Your subconscious has to know what you're doing. And that's, that's an awesome tip for the listeners. Write it 100%. down and get it written down. And then once you've got it done, cross it off. and It'll make you feel so empowered that you just did your goal. And it'll just make you want to go to the next one. That's so, that's so powerful. That's awesome. Absolutely. And, and, I, and I have a coach too. So... One of the big things I believe in is that you need to be coached, even if it's just a sounding board, somebody you have to talk to, and you're just doing all the talking. Because my coach doesn't really talk a lot to me. They just listen, and I'm answering my own questions, and it's just like having that person on the phone really just helps. Sometimes they do give me some input, like things I should do. But for the most part, just talking your stuff out, um, whether it's, it's a coach or someone in your life or even a therapist or something, like, you need to talk to somebody and get it out of your brain, from your brain out your mouth to somebody else. That, that's great. I mean, you're, you're, you're defining coaching to a T. It's someone who has detached uh, judgment. They're not going to judge you. They're there to listen yep. to you. They're asking you empowering questions. So they're making you think. I mean, you can't talk about this stuff to your wife or your friends because no, they, 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 they're emotional. They, they, they're going to tell you their opinion. They, you don't need their opinion. You need, to be, you, know, you need to have your energy level raised, which is obviously what's happening. You need to be able to sit in a space that's quiet and just be able to think about your problems and come up with solutions. And that's why I think coaching is really powerful. If people can't afford a coach, let them get a mentor, someone who's older who wants to give back. But find somebody right. who is in the real estate business who, uh, you know, listen, they want to mentor you. That's great. But once you see the power of coaching, I'm glad you brought that up because I think coaching is, is an awesome medium. That's what got me into the business and made me realize what an awesome business this is. Absolutely. 
you know, um, let me ask you, what is your biggest mistake in the business? You talk about you like you love making mistakes. What, what do you think your biggest? Um, mistakes? One of the biggest mistakes is um, I don't know what is one of my biggest mistakes. I guess I, my okay. So one of the things that people look at is that every time I become successful, or, or not just me, anybody in life, like every time you hear of like a a new movie star or like a new comedian or someone just pops up in your life, like, oh, well, that guy's great. You know, no one really looks at what it took for them to get there. So all the little incremental things that took this person to um, show up, all that stuff behind the scenes, successes, failures, successes, failures. So a lot of my failures are all little little mistakes and failures on a daily basis that um, that happen that eventually one day break through my ceiling. Um, So to give you one um, mistake, um, I guess maybe not being leveraged and doing this sooner or learning how much easier real estate was sooner. I should have done this 20 years ago. Maybe that's my one, one big mistake. Um, but on a daily basis, um, I shouldn't say daily, but on a weekly, monthly basis, we make small little mistakes, tweak, and then just, you know, we have breakthroughs in our business uh, and life with my agents, stuff like that. Yeah, it's you, you, you guys got to pivot, right? Yeah, exactly. Yep, pivot. You say the overnight sensation. Everyone calls it the overnight sensation. It's that rock band that over- overnight they've been comes. Yeah, rock band shows up. Like, oh, look how great they are! But you know, yeah. then you hear the story. They were behind the scenes twenty years. You know, working a bar for you know for fifteen dollars. Yep. Just they were the working out of their van, exactly. They were <laughs> yeah, going you know? in people's basements and garages, exactly. You know, that's, yeah. that's what it yeah. is. I agree. Um, on another note, what do you read? What do you like to read? What's your favorite book? Any real so estate? What, so yeah, so um, I do. I wish I could do more reading. It's you know, it's really hard though. I, a few years ago, I was reading a lot more than I am now. But as my kids have gotten older, um, before, now they're all into sports and dance and all that stuff. So it's harder for me because I want to spend time with them. And then when I get home from work at night, I want to spend time with them, or they want to spend time with me. So that five a.m. to like um, seven a.m. slot is um, is a great time for me to like absorb and learn and read. Um, I used to try to read a lot of books. Like if I were to talk about books, one would be like the Billionaire Real Estate Agent from Gary Keller. One is The One Thing written by Gary Keller. Um, you know, I, love, I like John Maxwell books. I love his leadership books. I have all of them. Um, and all the reading I do is basically leadership, growth, even from magazines, from um, Fortune to Inc. to um, Fast Company, anything I get my hand on. But honestly, now I more want quick reads than to sit down and read something from cover to cover. So I invest in like a Soundview, which is like a, it's like a summary company to just try to get the, the nuggets of these books instead of reading everything from cover to cover. I really don't have the time to. As my kids get older and as I find more time to do it, then yes, I want to get back to actually reading books cover to cover. But now I just want more quick info, little nuggets I could take with me, grow, learn. And when I drive, um, I listen to a lot of podcasts and um, uh, you know, um, like learning stuff instead of the radio. I don't really watch any TV. You know, they say the average human or American watches like four to five hours of TV a night. I don't. I'm always working, doing something. But um, I just always try to put knowledge in my head no matter what it is. I love the uh, growth books. I love John Maxwell. I think you're right. And I can see from your business, you know more or less that 80% of anybody's growth is, is, is their psychological. So you've definitely got that, you know, that leadership and that growth going on. And 20% is mechanical. So you know, basically, you're growing your business. It's all psychological. It's all about doing it and getting it done. And 20% is, me- is the mechanical part, which is part that you learn about. And that's not really the hard part, learning about real estate. Real estate is not a very difficult. I don't think no, it's, it's a very difficult uh, you know, um, business to learn. Once no, you've been doing it for a couple of years, you can learn it. It's just getting over that hump and saying, I can do it. That's, you that's know, I know people in this Excuse me, not in my market. But I know people in this business, all areas of the country. Like, um, there's, there's one gentleman in our company who's in um, Seattle, Washington. Um, he was in the business. He's in the business now for uh, less than 60 years. Um, within two, uh, he was a UPS driver, I believe, or something like that beforehand. But um, he was really good with the internet and learned at a quick level, like how much making making real estate. He's one of the top 10 agents in our whole company in less than I think it, it was three years. Now he's been with the company six, seven years now. And he's built other businesses and companies off of this, but he used real estate as that leverage piece to um, to grow everything else. But you don't have to be in the business twenty years. So the one big mistake, like you mentioned earlier, that I did was, you know, not knowing them what I know now, which you can't change. But um, you know, I see kids get into the business now a lot younger than me, and I'm only thirty-eight. They're in their like twenties, like 
and they're doing more business in two or three years than you know I've done in my whole career or what other brokers have done in, in their career. So uh, it's really cool to see how people who get it treat this like a business and just run with it. You know what's cool about that? When somebody's a beginner, they have no limiting beliefs, basically. They're going to get into it. They don't know what you can, what you can't do. So, I mean, you have somebody who's been doing real estate for 15 years and he's not very successful at it. He's got that limiting belief. Oh, you can't do that. You can't do that. Jake and I run into that all the time. Oh, you can't do no money down. Well, you can do no money down. You just have to know how to do it and you have to know that you can do it. So, um, that's really cool. A guy has been doing it for six years and all of a sudden he's killing it. And he's no different than anybody else. He just knows that he can do it and he has no limiting beliefs about it. That's, that's so cool. Right. And, and being with Keller Williams, um, you know, I love this company, and um, they give us a lot of systems and tools, and the books that they write, you know, really give you a game plan and show you how to uh, how to build a business. So anyone who really gets it will just latch onto that, and they can grow within our system, you know, exponentially. Let me uh, let me ask you about your deals. What you what do you think your best deal is, and why why is it your best deal? Uh, you mean um, real best estate? Real estate deal? Yeah. Um, I don't know the answer to that. Um, so you mean commission wise? Yeah, I guess, I guess commission wise. Commission investment, even starting your business. Um, so right now what, um, what we're doing. So, okay. So I run a basically a residential real estate practice. My firm, Keller Williams is residential real estate. For the most part, we do some commercial. My team is 99% focused on, um, residential, um, resales. Uh, we do some rental, stuff like that. Um, but for a small piece of my career, which I still work with now, is I've done some commercial work with um, uh, Starbucks, CVS, Walgreens, Mavis Tire, SDS Tire. Uh, that I love because what, what I like about that end of the business is um, it's all numbers driven. And there's, you know, people aren't fighting over toasters and lawn <laughs> equipment and stuff, you know, because I hate that piece of it. And that's why I have Donna, who's really good at that. I'm like, Donna, just, you know, take this off me. Um, but um, I, I love the numbers of the business. I, I love making the deal happen. I love seeing people be happy, but I hate when it gets down to fighting over little things. So um, I try to bring a lot more of that to my side of the table where um, I try to pull the emotions out of it. And honestly, on a daily basis, what I get paid for is to be an emotional coach for my sellers because they're the ones who at the end of the day when they're cutting me my commission check, they thank me for the way I got them to think throughout the transaction they thank me for the way that um, I've helped the transaction. Sometimes things don't go 100% as planned. Emotional but, roller coaster, right? For these sellers. Oh my God. Yeah. I, I, even my agents on emotional roller coaster. Myself, sometimes I'm up and down. Like sometimes I go look at the postman. He looks happy today. Maybe I'll do that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but um, what we're doing right now, one thing that's really exciting to me, it's called uh, expansion, mega agent expansion, where um, because we have good systems, um, with, so the real estate transaction, Everything that's happening in my office, from transaction coordinating to lead generation to admin processing, if you have that system really buttoned up, basically what we're doing with the Keller Williams system now is something called Mega Agent Expansion, where Keller Williams, uh, Gary Keller, who's a genius, um, came up with an idea of if you can take your name, your systems, your tools, and replicate them in other cities across the country, you could set up a referral system with agents in, um, Jake, where do you live again? Knoxville, Tennessee. Knoxville, Tennessee. So let's just say I go to Knoxville, Tennessee, and I find a great agent because it's all about the who, right? It's all about the person you're in business with. I find a great agent, like, and I let's say Jake, and I say Jake, I want to give you my systems, my tools, my leverage, my lead systems, and um, you're going to go out do all the appointments for me in Knoxville, Tennessee, and then when you bring the commission check in, we're going to split on a split that we agree upon. Uh, but a lot of agents don't have the wherewithal to do the systems, the marketing, or this or that to build a business. So why, why be a millionaire real estate agent once you could be 20 times over? So agents across the country now are opening up six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 expansion systems in other Keller Williams offices where they're growing themselves, where you're not paying for uh, rent, you're not paying for brick and mortar, you're not paying for admin staff out there. So the barrier to entry is minimal. Um, and you don't have to be licensed because you're licensed with the other agent. That agent out there is, is the licensed agent in that market. And it's just you know like a glorified referral fee basically in the end. But it's your systems, your tools, your marketing. So I'm saying to myself, holy crap. I've always wanted to get out of this little Maypack market and this is my way to do it. Like I've always wanted to go like Sarasota, um, other areas in New York. So right now I have an expansion team. We're launching in Long Island. I'm going to be launching one in the Bronx soon. 
And then from there, either I'll stay more local, but then I can go to other areas like Florida, California, wherever I want to go. But I got to find the right agent in those markets that are going to be a go-getter like myself, go out there, turn up the business, make the calls, do the presentations. If you find that person, then um, everything just starts to work as long as you're providing the systems and the tools. Um, like when I went to Long Island now, my partner out there, Carl, I never thought of this area in Long Island, but this guy is, he's really great, him and his wife. And I said, I have to go here. I said, these guys are talent. I got to help. I got to get my name out there. I got to help them grow, help them reach their income goals through my systems, my tools. And if I can make their um, income limitless with me and show them a better plan, people will, will join and say, hey, I want to be part of something bigger than myself. And that's what's really exciting right now about taking what I've done here and expanding it across the, the, uh, across the country. I can equate that to like what Jake and I do. Uh, we buy these little multifamily communities, 25 units here, 30 units here. They're all cash flowing. So you have all little generating revenues in every part of whatever, whether exactly. it's your market or a submarket. And it's just awesome. It's a cash machine. Once you get the system in place, and it's a lot of work. It's simple, but it's not easy. But once you get that system up and running like you're describing and you find the right people, and there are the right people out there. It's just a matter of you going out there and finding them. Uh-huh. And once you do that, you just start printing money. And that's the true way to create wealth right there. And what this also does is um, this helps me find – because one of the ways that I fail a lot is I become too trusting with people or I, or I take them for what they're worth. Um, where I've hired – I've made a lot of bad hires, a lot of bad hires. Not agents. I mean people in my life that were supposed to run my businesses or do admin processing, all that stuff. So um, what this allows me to do now as I'm growing this is um, – uh, what, what I become on a daily basis now is is a, um, I guess per se, like a recruiter and someone who's going to go out and find talent. So my job on a daily basis is to find talent, find people, put them in the right roles within the organization, have them do what they do best. Um, so by doing this expansion, it's making me think bigger than I ever could. And it's actually helped me button up my systems I use in my local market because I'm never going to stop my real estate team here because I have a good name and a good business. But everything I'm learning by expanding and where I see the loopholes or things that have fallen through the cracks – because we're expanding, it's just making me re-tighten up my processes and systems better here because my hub area, which is the Maypack market in northern Westchester and Putnam, um, it's going to just make that stronger. And as I continue to make that stronger through these other um, ventures I'm doing across the country, everything just works better. Um, so that's what's really cool about it. The other thing that's really cool about it is you have the financial freedom, but you also have the freedom of your lifestyle. If you want to pick up and leave New York and go somewhere, 100%. Months, that's Absolutely. like – that's like, let me go to Florida for a month when it's you know, 10 degrees in New York. You can do that. You can pick up, leave. You have the systems in place. You still have the money. Most of us have to get up in the morning, got to go to work. If we don't go to work, we're not getting paid. But it sounds like Lou, when he gets up in the morning, if he wants to work out another hour, you know, he's still getting paid. You know, he's still getting paid when he's sleeping. So that's, that's, that is a great, that's a great strategy. I, well, I now that, that you mentioned that, that's one, one of my big whys for doing this because eventually when I do retire, I want to move. I don't want to be brick and mortar anymore, you know, and that's one of the big transitions in real estate. You don't have to be brick and mortar. So if I want to go to Florida and run my 10, 12, 15 expansion teams across the country, I hop on a Google Hangout or a Skype call or something. We talk, we, we, you know, we, um, we coach and consult together, talk about goals, boom, shut down the laptop, go on the beach, whatever. Um, but I don't have to be brick and mortar. I don't, have to, I don't have to be there anymore. Yes, my Keller Williams franchise is brick and mortar. Yes, my sales team here is brick and mortar. But outside of those two businesses, which other people are actually running for me, Everything else I do, um, it it's, could be all done through the internet. I want to bring up one thing that, that Lou just touched on, and that was the bad hires because we've all been there, right? We've hired somebody and oh, yeah. it worked out. And I want to I want to pick your brain on this because our new mantra is we hire on attitude and ethics and we can teach you the rest. What do you think about that? Um, I absolutely agree with that because you can't give somebody a good attitude. I mean, you know, and you can't give them ethics. So if they can bring that to the table and you can teach them the rest, I, I do agree that that's a 110% way to look at it. Um, but people do have certain skill sets that they're comfortable working in and, and there are things that they're not comfortable with. You've got to find out two things. One, what, what, what's their comfort zone to working? Find out what they do best. Leverage them to the highest, highest that possible. But what are their goals and aspirations in life? Like how big do they see themselves? Where do they want to go? So when I put somebody in a leadership position, like a real true like a CEO or a team leader in, uh, in my Keller Williams world, it's got to be somebody who wants something more than just a paycheck. If somebody's coming to the table for a paycheck, they're coming to me for the wrong reasons and they don't want bigger things out of life. So what I do with them is I give them a salary, but also I give them a lot of um, bonus and overrides on things that they do because it has to be somebody who's driven by bonus and percentages and salaries. Other people in my world, such as admin and stuff like that, 
I have to make sure that those people are who they say they are and good at, and they're good at the tasks that I need done. And then on my um, listing agents and buyer agents, they need to be people. They need to be people, people, but also need to have a high drive enough to get them to sign up and do business with us, not just um, waiting for business to come to them and wait for the, the buyer or seller to say, okay, now I'm ready to go. It's, you know, they have to have that mentality to, you know, ABC, always be closing kind of deal. Wow, Lou, uh, took so much away uh, from from this last 45 minutes. Uh, I'm just so impressed with how you scaled your business. And uh, and the one quote that I wrote that you said is that success leaves clues. I thought that was that was that was awesome. And you just are you're a master at leveraging your time. So I think that that's a take home for everybody to see. How can I get other folks to do the stuff that I don't like, put them in positions where their strengths are, are going to just uh, make them the best that they can be and then put those folks to work, and then that's going to free you up to do the things that you love. So I just I think that was, was fantastic, and you're, you're a master networker. You may not believe it yourself, but I think that you're, you're you know, really it, it shows from what you've done in your career. You're a master networker, so uh, really appreciate the time on the call today. Thank you. Thank you for everything, guys, and I uh, hope to do another one of these with you guys real soon. Lou, thanks. All right, take care. Take care, bye-bye. We trust that you enjoy the Wheelbarrow Profits podcast. Visit jakeandgino.com, your one-stop shop for everything multifamily. See you next time when Jake and Gino share more of their investing secrets with you.